KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. After that drag racing crash in Kerrville that killed three people a little more than a week ago, we have heard a lot of viewer questions about safety protocols at these events. Our Courtney Friedman went to the Alamo City Metroplex, Motorplex rather, today to speak with the experts there. They didn't want to comment on that crash in Kerrville because they weren't there, but they want the public to know what a safe event looks like. Any expert will tell you racing events always pose some amount of danger and risk, but at Alamo City Motorplex, there's a laundry list of safety protocols. We follow the IHRA guidelines. Vehicles are, are inspected before every race. Um, drivers, suits, and safety gear is inspected before every race as well. Um, we have we have personnel that check the track. Those International Hot Rod Association regulations are not state law, so there aren't many legal ramifications if you don't follow them. But Motorplex General Manager Daniel Cleveland says at his track, those guidelines are set in stone. The rules, which are recommendations, state that these fences need to be at least 30 feet from the barriers on the racetrack. These are about 50 feet away. And on top of that behind me, I'm about 15 to 20 feet away from these stands. The barriers are made of cement and go all the way to the finish line. So everything looks good here. Safety tech Jimmy Herrera inspects every car that races at the motorplex, checking for leaks and loose parts. When the vehicle comes in, I look how the driver's sitting and then look for the safety belt. Now on these safety belts, you'll see the date. Both safety belts and inspections have to be valid within the last two years. I'll ask the driver to see his helmet and then of course, Make sure he's got his gear. Official starter and longtime racer Jerry Romines preps the track with rubber and glue for safety. When the people do the burnouts, the heat in their tires activate the glue. This is the official IHRA rule book. Anyone, drivers, spectators can order this online and it can be sent to them. Or you can go to the Alamo City Motorplex website and all of this information is there as well. From the Motorplex, Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And we've talked to several people who were in Kerrville just feet away from that fatal crash who say the plastic barricades ended before the finish line and spectators were only 10 feet away from the cars and those barricades. Kerrville police still investigating that crash. They have not yet confirmed those reports. Meantime, attorneys today filing a personal injury lawsuit on behalf of the family of six year old Daniel Trujillo Jones. He was killed in that tragic drag, drag racing crash at the airport race wars 2 event in Kerrville, along with two other adults who were also seriously injured and two children who required medical treatment. The attorney says this lawsuit will allow for a full investigation into what went wrong. It is election day. Polls will close in less than an hour. The turnout in today's joint election has been slow but steady at a lot of the polling sites. Besides state constitutional amendments and school bond issues, there was also the race for District 118 state representative. Jesse Degoriato is live at the Bear County Elections Office with what some voters are saying about that race. Jesse. District 118 candidates have been in a runoff to decide who will fill the vacancy created when Leo Pacheco left politics. Yet earlier today, we saw a friendly chance encounter between Democrat Frank Ramirez and Republican John Lujan, opponents who've been locked in a tight race. Ramirez has said the race is a stepping stone to further inroads by Republicans in South Texas. Lujan says he doesn't blame Republicans for wanting to build on that momentum. Both vying for voters, some of whom told me what it's like voting in such political charged and often divisive times. We've got to come together. We got to meet. We've got to to work together and to do the outreach and educate everyone in the community about what's going on. We vote all these people in for them to do for us and then they somehow or another they just go a different route and they start doing for themselves. Castaneda is a Republican Juarez didn't say. Their votes among the 30,000 cast today alone. Total during this uh, joint election, 76,000 according to the Bear County Elections Office, but only about 6.4% of registered voters, but more voters coming out before polls close at 7 o'clock. We're live outside the Bear County Elections Office. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. All right, we'll have those results as soon as they do close. Thank you, Jesse. We all need to get from point A to point B, whether you prefer to drive, bike, walk or ride. Mass transit options 
they do have an effect on you. And for tonight's case that explains live stream, we'll be talking about San Antonio's troubled mass transit history. You can catch case that explains transportation in San Antonio tonight starting at 710. We're going to live stream it on KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app on your streaming devices and on the KSAT Facebook page. Again, that's 710 tonight. The San Antonio police need your help in identifying a robbery suspect accused of shooting before taking off a stolen merchandise. That robbery and shooting happened back on October 16th at the Alien Smoke and Vape Shop located off Babcock Road, not far from Peru Road. San Antonio police say someone tried to stop the suspect from stealing but was shot in the process. Anyone with information asked to call Crime Stoppers at the number on your screen. A driver is not facing any charges after police say they hit and killed a man who was walking in traffic dressed in a Fred Flintstone costume. This happened on the northeast side just after 6 o'clock this morning on O'Connor Road and Randolph Boulevard. Police say before that crash, the man in costume was swinging a stick-like object at cars while in the road. After he was hit, police say the driver did stop to try to help, but that man had already died. The weeks of preparation are all for today on Dia de los Muertos. Yeah, some of today's celebrations taking place in the cemetery, so families can adorn the grave sites with flowers. Alicia Barrera visited Mission Park Funeral Chapels to find out who is being honored today and the stories behind their memories. For many families, coming to the cemetery is always difficult, but on one day, on Dia de Muertos, they come here happy, knowing that the memory of their loved one who they miss will never fade. At cemeteries across Mexico, preparations for Day of the Dead celebrations began yesterday to transform gray cemeteries to shades of orange and gold. There, families eat and drink as they welcome the souls of the dead for a brief visit. For some here at home, taking part in the celebration is new and offers healing. This is our first year celebrating it. Stephanie and her four-year-old son Samuel honor the memory of Gabriel Sainz, who had been cancer-free for seven years. The last two years, you know, we've been in and out of the hospital, and in May of this year, he passed away. An altar keeps his spirit alive at home, and today, Samuel has placed two new pictures of his beloved dad on the altar at the entrance of Mission Park. Do you miss your daddy? Yeah. I just wanted to get him, you know, to do something in memory of my husband, you know, his father. Start him off young. Stephanie wants this holiday to remain joyful. As for Samuel, if he could tell his daddy one more thing. Um, take me up, please. To please pick him up. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Several slowdowns on area highways this evening. Samuel King joins us now with the very latest. Sam. Good evening, Steve and Myra. Some slowdowns, including on 281 uh, this evening, um, both directions on 281, especially uh, north and south of Loop 410. So let's take a look at your travel time right now. Had a stalled vehicle at Bassey heading southbound. So 26 minutes now for 604 to downtown, 15 minutes heading in the other direction. So watch out for that this evening. Some other uh, slowdowns include here on the uh, northeast side near Loop 410 and Austin Highway. So let's take a look at a travel time on 35 between uh, New Braunfels and uh, Loop 410, forgot where I was going for a moment, but hopefully you're not doing that on the roads. 33 minutes between 410 and New Braunfels, 26 minutes if you're heading downtown. So again, watch out for some various uh, traffic and delays throughout the area this evening. 410 and Baron, Baron Beidle looking better. And keep an eye on things this evening, guys. Thank you, Samuel. Look outside with live cam this evening. A beautiful day out there again today. Felt like maybe a little more humidity, but we're waiting on some big changes. Yeah, bring on the cold. Oh boy, we have a lot to plan for tomorrow. Big changes. First and foremost, it's going to be warmer in the morning tomorrow than it will be in the afternoon. So these readings of 70s, you know, near 80, gone. We are up to 79 today. We're not going to see that until maybe early next week. Temperatures right now, right around the 80 degree mark, 70s in the hill country, but you look farther to the north on the cooler side of this cold front that's headed our way, and we're in the 40s. I mean, we're talking 47 Midland, 49 Abilene, 46 right now in Lubbock. Guess where that cooler air is headed? 
right into our neighborhood. It's just gradually going to make it here. So this evening, nothing to worry about. More of the same hint of humidity in the air. Temperatures 8 o'clock near 70 and then upper 60s overnight tonight. Tomorrow, as I mentioned, we'll start the day warmer than it will be in the afternoon. So at the bus stop in the morning, you'll want the umbrella. We'll have some drizzle and showers mid 60s. By the time the kids get off the bus, they may want that sweatshirt or jacket will be in the upper 50s with intermittent showers and storms becoming breezy out there as well. Show you the future cast and talk about uh, even cool, cooler weather for Thursday coming right up. See a lot to talk about I'm trying to squeeze it right in. Stephanie. Adam, thank you. Now coming up tonight on the night beat, busy night tonight with elections and lots of other big stories. But here's what we're working on for tonight. Specifically, we do have an update on that four year old boy who was shot in the back during a drive by. And tonight we're going to sit down with Romeo's mother to talk about his progress as police continue to look for his shooter. Also, two school districts are trying to keep up with the growth in their districts and tonight they're hoping that you, the voter, will pass bonds to help them achieve that. We're going to have the results from those elections and a lot more. And guys, that's coming up tonight on The Night Beat. We'll be right back after the break. All right, just about time now for what is the weekly briefing on COVID cases in our community. Yeah, let's check in at City Hall. We expect Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf. Metro Health, Dr. Claude Jacob, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Some more improvements in our fight against COVID-19. The positivity rate now has dropped to 1.6%. Cases continue to go in a downward trajectory and we're seeing gradual improvements in our local hospitals. We are at a low risk level for the first time since January 6, 2021, this summer, uh, and we are seeing steady improvements. If you haven't already, please get your vaccine and complete your vaccine series. And if you know someone who hasn't yet been vaccinated, please encourage them to do so. All of our success so far in the fight against COVID-19 in this latest round can be attributed to folks getting vaccinated. So if you know someone who hasn't yet been vaccinated, please encourage them. And remember, you can get vaccinated at a Metro Health location and you could be eligible for a $100 HEB gift card. Visit covid19.sanantonio.gov for a list of Metro Health vaccine locations. In terms of our case count, today we're reporting 155 new cases of COVID-19. Our seven-day moving average has also gone down to 185. Uh, we have lost three new, uh, we are reporting three new deaths this evening. Uh, and again, we have lost well over 4,000 and close to 5,000 of our, our neighbors and loved ones during this pandemic. So please keep them and their families in your prayers this evening. In our local hospitals, there are 200 patients uh, with COVID-19. There were 22 admissions in the last 24 hours, 88 patients in the ICU and 38 on ventilators with COVID-19. 79% of patients in area hospitals are unvaccinated and we have 10 patients who are children. Uh, very quickly on vaccines, uh, Metro Health is continuing their efforts to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And as of today, 1.5 million people, actually 1,542,775 people uh, of the eligible population have received at least one dose and nearly 1.3 million people uh, have been fully vaccinated. We're also reporting a new number, the number of people who have been who have received a booster shot. That's 107,482 people since mid-August. We're making great progress toward getting our population vaccinated. And you may have heard today CDC advisors unanimously voted to recommend Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children between the ages of five and 11. If the recommendations are report, uh, endorsed later by the CDC director, children could be eligible to receive their COVID-19 shot within the next several days. Parents are encouraged to reach out to their pediatrician offices as they will be the first essential sites for COVID-19 vaccine uh, for children between the ages of five through 11. Metro Health, along with the Department of State Health Services, is working closely with those pediatricians to make sure they have the appropriate vaccine allocations and to provide support they might need. Let me turn it now to Judge Wolf. Well, thanks, Mayor, and things really have uh, really, really substantially improved, and I really think we're we're on a downward trend in terms of uh, COVID patients, in terms of positivity rate. Everything just is moving in the right direction, but. You still need to be careful out there. Um, as the mayor said, the CDC approved the uh, uh, vaccines for uh, children five to 11 years old. 
Uh, I think the director, we're waiting on him to sign off today, but we've received 5,000 Pfizer doses at the uh, Bear County Hospital District, UHS. And uh, we will start uh, taking reservations tomorrow and uh, for the Wonderland site. I know many of you have gone out there to, to, to get their shots. I think we've done over 450,000 shots out there. So most of you know where the Wonderland uh, site is, but you start making reservations tomorrow. If the directors sign off, we'll start giving, uh, giving uh, uh, vaccines to children Thursday and Friday. We'll be closed over the weekend, but opening it back up on Monday. If you want to get a reservation site, uh, you, you can go to universityhealthsystem.com and, and, and start registering tomorrow. Uh, Mayor announced how many uh, booster shots we've done. Uh, we've done about 22,000 of those, uh, 22,270 of those out at the Wonderland uh, uh, site. The other thing that's going in the right direction also, and I've been tracking it since, it's, uh, since school started, uh, over 2,000, oh, excuse me, 207,554 children uh, have, uh, have uh, contacted uh, COVID while they were in school, and that number was as October the 24th. But the numbers have gone down. We're at like 4,185 during that week, and from a high, we were running around 43,399. So uh, that is also looking a lot better in schools. Um, but this thing has taken a great toll on us. Uh, I was reading, I don't know whether you missed the article or not, but um, regarding John uh, Hopkins University of a study of uh, COVID deaths, over 5 million uh, COVID deaths have been uh, uh, found uh, around the world and probably much higher than that because in some of the undeveloped countries, uh, they have not uh, uh, have the accounting system of, of what's happening. So over 5 million people have lost their lives to uh, COVID. And in the United States, uh, we had the highest number of any other nation, 746,000. So the county judge there talking about the toll the COVID-19 uh, epidemic pandemic has uh, wrought on the world and the United States. But there's still good news in the local update. 1.6% the positivity rate as it continues to go down. And for the first time in a long time, we are at low risk in Bear County. And the mayor talked about the CDC advisory panel mm -hmm. today signing off on the vaccine for kids ages 5 to 11. We're still waiting on the CDC director to sign off on that, but he did say that parents should check with their pediatricians first. That should be the first stop to get your kids vaccinated, but that Metro Health will be supporting in that, so we'll wait to see what exactly that looks like. Yeah, let's switch over to weather real quick because we are seeing the effects of this cold front in other parts of the state of Texas, Adam. Yeah, we showed you those temperatures off to the north. Abilene, Midland, you get up to Lubbock and Amarillo. We're in the 40s right now. That's behind this cold front. Let's take a look at the front right now. It's still just north of our area. I mean, not through Junction yet, but it is through Ozona continues to gradually push southward. It's going to get a little bump with some upper level energy that's going to eventually push it through midday tomorrow, probably about one o'clock time frame, give or take around San Antonio. But there is some activity behind the front. You see some showers and even some snow, Colorado to Kansas. And we are anticipating some of that moisture and dampness to move our way. And it's going to start with the morning commute tomorrow. So here's our future cast tomorrow morning. Anticipate drizzle and passing sprinkles with the most persistent rain probably in the hill country. So a little bit of dampness out there for the morning commute that then should turn into more persistent and heavier showers and thunderstorms. We're not really expecting any severe weather, just some pockets of downpours and off and on or intermittent showers with rumbles of thunder and little brief areas of lightning as well. That's going to last through the evening commute. So the evening commute, probably more water on the roadways than we have in the morning, and then some lingering showers all the way through the Thursday morning commute, even just some areas of drizzle and sprinkles to start the day on Thursday. Temperatures are going to take a big hit. So tomorrow we start the day warmer than we end the day. Actually, tomorrow morning we'll be in the 60s. By the afternoon, we'll be in the 50s. So you'll want the jacket tomorrow afternoon, not so much in the morning. Have the umbrella handy all day long. There could be some delays on the roadways, both morning and evening commute. We get into Thursday. We get rid of the morning drizzle and light showers, but the clouds linger and temperatures 
probably not even making it out of the 50s. So jacket weather all day long on Thursday by Friday through the weekend. It's back to sunshine and in turn temperatures rebound a bit 60s on Friday and then 70s into the weekend. And by the way, the humidity is going to remain at bay through the weekend. OK, thank you, Adam. All right, talk about a great way to keep your players focused on the season. Not on the coach, Greg. Yeah, because they got the job done this past weekend. But some of these players will admit when they saw the athletic director in their team yeah. meeting, got a little nervous because they could go out either way. Either he's leaving or he's staying. When we come back, we'll talk to the UTSA football players about keeping their coach around for the next decade. And should there be a change at quarterback for UT during their slump coming up? Since UTSA head football coach Jeff Trailer, University announced he has signed a new 10 year contract, $28 million extension that will keep Coach Trailer until 2031. We're finally hearing from the players. Some of them admit they were nervous after Trailer's name popped up in the search for a new head coach at Texas Tech. And then more recently, news of Gary Patterson's departure at DCU. And when they saw UTSA athletic director Dr. Lisa Campos come into their meeting room on Sunday, that even heightened their concerns until she confirmed the Trailer was their man for the next decade. I was just excited, you know, uh, for the younger guys and uh, people who are, you know, wanting to commit here or getting offered by us, uh, you know, not trying to figure out if he's going to stay or if he should come here for Coach Trailer or not. Um, you know, just great for the program and uh, San Antonio and everything he's doing, the culture that he uh, is instilling in us. Um, and we're just blessed to have him, and uh, especially for another 10 years. It was well deserved. Uh, there are not many guys that are built like him. You know, great. He's a great man off the field for this community, for this university. You know, I'm a super excited for the guys that are going to come after me, that they're able to be able to be with a man so great. And I'm just super excited for, you know, what this university is going to, you know, be in the long run. There are buyout clauses in the contract starting at seven and a half million dollars a year. But Trailer says he's committed to stay after the triangle of toughness he has created. And now see if they can stretch their win streak to nine this Saturday in El Paso against UTEP. Fired in a three-game losing streak and out of the Big 12 Conference Championship picture, now the Longhorns considered making a change at quarterback. That's a big question. Hudson Card started the season as number one on the depth chart, but was replaced by Thompson after he struggles against Arkansas. But the Longhorns have had made a habit of giving up big leads in the last three losses, the longest losing streak since Charlie Strong era. In Thompson's defense, he has thrown eight touchdown passes in the last three games and was watched his offensive line fail on protection to go along with a receiver drops. Right now, Steve Sarkeesian is still Sticking with Thompson for Iowa State. I've never been in favor of kind of rotating quarterbacks and you let a guy play through it. Um, I think Casey's done some really good things for us. Obviously, there's plays he'd love to have back, like like all of us would. I would as a play caller. That's that's the way it goes. Um, I think Hudson is is chomping at the bit for another opportunity, which is great. He's working hard. Um, and, and we'll see as we move forward if that opportunity presents itself to him. All right, Thompson will start Saturday against Iowa State on the road at 630, but doesn't mean he will finish. The fight in Texas Aggies get back to work this Saturday when they face number 12 Auburn at home at Kyle Field. They'll be looking to extend their win streak. They started with the upset of Alabama to four games when the Tigers come calling off a 31-20 victory against Ole Miss. In the Jimbo Fisher era, they have beaten the Crimson Tide now for the first time at home since joining the SEC. Now they want to do it again against Auburn. It all goes, comes and goes. I was when I was at Auburn. Uh, it was Auburn and Georgia was like that for a long stretch, and then it finally broke and went somewhere. I mean, eventually those things break, so it'll happen and, and we'll go. So, but we don't worry about those things. Each year is a different year, and each thing's a different thing. You got to play. There you go. We'll find out Saturday with a 2:30 kickoff in College Station. Good luck to the Houston Astros tonight. We look to try and get even with the Atlanta Braves in the World Series after taking Game Five in Atlanta on Sunday night, nine to five. And it's another must win for Houston and if they want to force a seventh the deciding game for their second World Series title. The Braves looking for their first in 26 years. Batter up is at 7.09 and not a second or minute sooner. <laughs> They're that precise yes. <laughs> in Major League Baseball. Play ball. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. You got it. Our Cakes Up Q&A is up next. You've heard the stories of labor shortages across the country, from those images of cargo ships stuck off the coast mm -hmm. to what we're seeing here locally. Some restaurants, some businesses unable to have the business that they are used to because of staffing issues. So let's talk about what is playing out in our own community with Ed Arnold. He is the managing editor of the San Antonio Business Journal. Uh, thanks for being here, Ed. Uh, first time for us having you here, and we're glad you could find some time for us. So let's talk about 
how things are shaping up in San Antonio when it comes to the labor shortage. What does our local picture look like? Absolutely. It's been a steady march of improvement all year long. Started the year off at a little more than 7% unemployment rate, which is very high. Uh, Pre-pandemic unemployment rate in San Antonio is beneath 3%, which is essentially everyone who wants to get a job can have one. Uh, and we're still at five as of recently as a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the, the positive signs, are, though, are that we're in the right trajectory. We keep marching down report after report. There have been some bumps along the way. But I think that the the, the slack between demand going up for these services, restaurants, hotel services, tourist attractions, and the pace of being able to hire for those positions is beginning to catch up. We may be still several months ago away from being back down to closer to that pre-pandemic unemployment level, but we make an incredible progress in Bear County in particular. How is the shortage playing out when it comes to, I mean, we just saw the, no hi the now hiring signs that are out there. How is this playing out? for people that own restaurants and for the travel industry, which is so huge in San Antonio historically. What are people seeing when they check into a hotel or they go to get to a restaurant? Absolutely. I spoke with a hotel operator over the summertime and he was gearing up for what we was hoping to be a pretty strong summer. Uh, but he was warning guests that they weren't necessarily going to get the same level of maid service that they were used to. They might not be able to get their toiletries refilled every day. Some of that was supply chain issues, but uh, another part of it was simply not having enough staff to, to handle all of the rooms. Uh, that has improved. Uh, again, as the summer ended, I also heard that many of his employees, once schools opened back up, they felt like they had childcare again. They were willing to come back to work at full time where they may have been part time before. So there has been a you know, significant improvement even there. We've seen it in restaurants too. Restaurants have cut lunch services. They've cut items off their menu simply because they didn't have enough uh, service workers to handle the loads that they were getting. But it's still closer to where we were just 90 days ago. We're closer to where we were pre-pandemic than we were just 90 days ago. It's it's positive that we're seeing signs of improvement. Uh, are you seeing that really all uh, widespread of range wide range, I should say, of industries are being impacted or is it mostly things like hotels and the hospitality industry in San Antonio? Right. I, I've seen it across the board. There's almost no industry that we haven't heard have difficulty at staffing. It's more pronounced in restaurants and retail because those are businesses that we all interact with. But everything from healthcare, legal services, uh, really, there is not been a part of manufacturing it has not been a part of the economy that has not had some struggle over the last year with hiring. Almost every single employer that has been looking has had to up their wages. Um, and that has been a big part of driving up some of the wages that we've seen improve over the uh, over the course of the summertime. Are you seeing any improvement at all or hearing of any improvement at all? in the supply chain. I mean, the most obvious is you drive by many of the car lots in San Antonio and they're empty of new cars. So you, I mean, you try and get a part for something that you think should be in the warehouse and it's not there. I mean, are you are you noticing that it's improving? And if when do you think we will get back to so-called normal when it comes to the supply chain? Right. It's it's going to be longer than we would all hope. I think that this Christmas, we're going to have a harder time finding a lot of the things at the last minute that we may have been used to. I've been encouraging all of my friends and family to get their Christmas shopping done early if they can, because there's going to be continued backlog for things that we're just used to being able to get. I've heard from a business owners saying that the kind of containers that they were using for their manufacturing processes just aren't available. So they're out looking for alternatives, out looking for other available uh, uh, suppliers. Um, and what you end up seeing is the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, fish in the pond, HEB, they're probably going to be the first to get their stuff onto the shelves. But it, it trickles down into those smaller retailers and smaller businesses. And I think it will probably be next year before we actually feel uh, a little bit of normality when it comes to uh, being able to get parts. Uh, I, certainly the car industry will probably be middle of next year before it catches back up to, to demand. Yeah, I know we're all certainly waiting for that. Before we let you go here, Ed, um, you mentioned the, the rise in wages attracting uh, more workers and helping to fill these shortages. Is that what you think the key here is to, to ending this labor shortage? Or are there some other factors that are going to come into play? There's certainly other factors. I mean, it, raising wages are the quickest and most obvious ways for for uh, a location of business to get new people in the door. But it causes a backlash too 
existing uh, employees are at a very high quit rate because they're jumping to other jobs looking for other wages. Generally, that's healthy in an economy overall. We want people to be making the close to their their value as humanly possible. Uh, but it takes a little while for businesses to catch up and consumers to catch up. And some price increase is going to follow that in the long run. Uh, but no question, the quickest way for some of these folks to to fill short term and desperate needs for employees is to is to bite the bullet and increase their wages as best they can. Ed Arnold, the managing editor of the San Antonio Business Journal, appreciate your time admiring the Thank guitars you. on the wall behind you as well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know they're probably there for a reason. We'll have to talk about that the next time you come on. I'm in for it. All right, deal. I'm in for it. <laughs> All right, we will see you next time. We'll be right back. Traffic conditions slowly improving uh, out there on the roadways, but we still have some spots of red, and we'll show you uh, that coming up. But let's do some construction. First of all, we'll have this closure again. The uh, North and southbound left lanes on 35 at Conrad's will be closed as they continue their bridge work that kicks off at nine o'clock. Also, if you make your way into town, there we go. Uh, this is 35 between FM 1103 and 2252. Also some lane closures in that area, so you'll have to watch out for that. Also on the north side, 281 to Stone Oak Parkway, some alternating closures uh, from 9 to 5 as they continue their work out there. And this closure also going on this week kicks off at 9. Uh, loop 1604 eastbound at I-10. The eastbound ramp to I-10 will be closed for some road work to this evening. Already seeing some delays out there. Also still seeing some delays in 281 southbound. 26 minutes now between 1604 and downtown. But once you hit Grayson, guys, things look a lot clearer. Thank you, Samuel. A CDC panel discussing the data now and whether to give emergency use authorization for the shots. The CDC director could give the final green light to allow shots to go into arms of kids as soon as tomorrow. ABC's Morgan Norwood has the latest from Los Angeles. Millions of child-sized doses of Pfizer's COVID vaccine already shipped from the company's facilities to distribution centers, pharmacies, and clinics across the country. The rollout comes as an independent CDC advisory committee weighs in on recommendations for emergency use authorization of Pfizer's COVID vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. All of this ahead of CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky's final green light. She opened the meeting by making a strong case for vaccinating younger children. We have watched as the education gaps that exist in this country have widened as this virus has disproportionately impacted racial and ethnic minority communities. Pediatric vaccination has the power to help us change all of that and to let us move towards schools as we once knew it. In Nebraska, the vaccine can't come soon enough. One Omaha elementary school closing its doors following an outbreak of COVID-19. My heart goes out to the families impacted by that because I know it's a very difficult situation. I wish it was different. Pfizer's data shows the vaccine is nearly 91% effective against symptomatic illness in kids 5 to 11. It also appeared safe with none of the children experiencing that rare heart inflammation side effect known as myocarditis. Still, some parents are apprehensive. The Kaiser Family Foundation found that one third of parents wanted to wait and see before vaccinating their kids, while another third are anxiously awaiting the rollout. I think protecting kids is the way to go. It's critically important that clinics are available in the evenings and on weekends because a lot of parents in America don't get time off work to take their kids in to get vaccinated. We need to make sure that every parent who wants to get their kid vaccinated can do so as soon as possible. And there could be a bit of demand with this pediatric vaccine, so experts have a few suggestions. First, check with your doctor's office, then the school, followed by mass vaccination sites, clinics, and pharmacies. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Los Angeles. All right, for those of you who've been waiting for our first real taste of extended cold weather, mm -hmm. the wait may be about over. <laughs> Get ready for jacket weather all day on Thursday, all day long, and you're going to need it a bit tomorrow as well. We have really a lot to go over and a lot to hit on here, so we're going to get right into it. Becoming cooler throughout the day tomorrow, so in the morning, it'll be warmer than the afternoon. Upside down temperature day. Intermittent rain throughout the day tomorrow, even lingering into Thursday morning. The jacket weather all of Thursday, the entire day. Let's talk about it, starting with temperatures and the cooler air and where it is now and when it's going to get here. 77 currently, still comfortable outside. A hint of humidity in the air with a dew point at 60 with that east southeasterly breeze at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. 
lot of sunshine overhead today. You look off to the north. That's where we have the cloud cover in turn some cooler temperatures. But here Pleasanton, Carrizo Springs, 81. Gatula making it to 86. Meanwhile, lower 70s in the hill country. You get on the cooler side of that cold front. Temperatures right now in the 40s from 47 in Midland to 42 in Amarillo. So there's that cooler air off to the north. It's slowly spilling southward. It's going to get this cold front's going to get nudged by some upper level energy and that's going to sweep it through about midday tomorrow. Anytime around the noon hour, give or take. So temperatures tomorrow will be falling off into the 50s by the afternoon. And this is going to be the trend for afternoon temperatures 50s tomorrow afternoon. Only 50s for Thursday afternoon. The warmest we'll get on Thursday is about 56 degrees. And then as the sun returns, temperatures rebound again. And by Friday, we're back into the 60s. So this is a pretty impactful cold front. Uh, not only will you need the jacket for tomorrow afternoon through Thursday, but also some damp commutes on the way. Look at all this moisture behind the front. Not only the thick low clouds, which we'll have in place for two days straight, but they'll also be throwing some showers at us, particularly during the day tomorrow. So let's take a look at our future cast and don't pay too close attention to exactly where it's showing the showers at any given time. This is 5 a.m. I think we'll have drizzle around town and some sprinkles as well. So some dampness to start the morning, but that dampness is going to turn into downright uh, wet conditions with wet roadways and ponding of water on the roadways as we get more is more basically efficient rain producers for the afternoon. So during the daylight hours tomorrow, we'll, trans we'll transition from drizzle and sprinkles to showers and thunderstorms. Some heavier embedded downpours here and there, some rumbles of thunder, a little bit of lightning as well. We see that off and on in nature. It's not going to be continuous, but intermittent throughout the day tomorrow and the evening commute. I expect the evening commute to be a little more problematic than the morning commute when it comes to persistent rainfall and ponding of water on the roadways. Even lingering into Thursday morning, we think some areas of drizzle. By the time it's all said and done, late Thursday morning, we could see anywhere from about a half inch to an inch and a half of rainfall across our area. That's just as a general rule of thumb. Of course, it depends exactly on where the heaviest downpour is set up. But this evening, nothing to worry about. Temperatures lower 70s by 8 o'clock. We'll be in the upper 60s overnight tonight. And keep in mind, we're going to start the day tomorrow warmer than the afternoon. So in the morning at the bus stop, 66, not bad, a hint of humidity in the air, but you'll want the umbrella. Pack the jacket or the sweatshirt in the kid's backpack because later on in the day, we'll be down in the 50s. By the time they get off the bus in the afternoon, it'll be down in the 50s. And you'll want the umbrella as well as the rain will become a little bit heavier for the daylight hours tomorrow. And that'll linger a little bit through tomorrow night. Also becoming breezy. Let's not forget about the wind. It's going to pick up behind that cold front. So you'll notice the wind tomorrow afternoon on into Thursday. Thursday, 40s in the morning. 50s by the afternoon and then by Friday through the weekend we have got our afternoon temperatures back in the 60s and 70s. So get ready for a couple of cooler and damp days on the way. Yeah, thank you Adam. In case you missed it coming up next. Good morning to you. Hope you slept well last night or had a good overnight shift. It is Tuesday, November 2nd. Antonio police and Crime Stoppers need your help finding a suspect wanted for an armed robbery that happened in the North Star Mall parking garage. So it happened back on October 18th. Police say the suspect approached the victim with a gun, demanded their car keys, and then sped off in a vehicle. Bringing you up to date on other news, new at 5, an Edgewood ISD police officer now indicted on federal wire fraud charges. Fernando Chancon Jr. arrested yesterday by the FBI. The charges from his tenure with the Maverick County Sheriff's Office. The 41-year-old accused of soliciting and accepting bribes of money and other things of value to remove pending tickets and arrest warrants against citizens. San Antonio police investigating a shooting on the north side. They're looking for a woman they believe shot a man twice at the Gardenwood Apartments. Investigators say that man was not being cooperative, but he did tell them he was doing maintenance on a car when the woman came up behind him and shot him once in the leg and then a second time in the abdomen. Police said the woman took off in a car. They aren't sure if she lived at the apartments or what her relation is to that victim. If you green machine, we have everything from cabbage to lettuce, but we also have strawberries. And it's so cool because these students get to see the product start to finish. And let's see. Mmm. 
delicious. So this program is, is sort of that first opening of the gates and, and exposing these students to better, high quality, more nutritious food. <laughs>